Good morning, everyone. Um, my lecture is titled Undomiciled as part of the Social EM lecture series. I want to give a special thanks to the entire Social EM um, ethics and palliative care team, and especially a shout out to Dr. Warshaw and Sim for really advocating for this lecture series and for Chrissy's amazing lecture a few weeks ago. So quick outline, wanted to talk a little bit of some stuff in the news, uh, language and stigma as related to individuals experiencing homelessness, some basic statistics, what we're currently doing, what we can do, and some resources included in there. So I hope that when you come out of this lecture, you're able to speak with patients with a more non-stigmatizing terminology able to recite basic trends and racial disparities for undomiciled individuals and understand current New York City resources and maybe have a little bit of a plan and know how to get uh, patients to access resources and how you can help them a little bit more. So some good news, uh, as we all know, COVID-19 was a really horrible thing for much of our community and city. And one of the really amazing programs that New York City did was actually taking individuals out of the shelter system. And I'm sure all of us had patients that we helped kind of negotiate some of this process and put them into hotels. And this was to try and reduce uh, proximity of individuals, increase social distancing and decrease disease spread. And it was a really successful program. Um, but some bad news. Uh, NIMBYs, if you're not familiar with the term, it's a not in my backyard and on the Upper West Side, which is generally considered to be a community of progressive ideals and democratic values, actually attacked these individuals and tried to kick them out of their area and hired a Giuliani era mayoral lawyer, uh, Randy Mastro, to kind of threaten the city. And de Blasio, of course, caved and groups like the Legal Aid Society actually stepped in and threatened to sue the city for this removal. Um, I just wanted to include some words from one individual who is part of that, who is living, who has moved to the Upper West Side. Um, why do you look at people like that because we're homeless? We're trying to get on our feet, get our own place. We have no choice. The mayor sent us here. They saying Black Lives Matter, but they don't want Black Lives in this area. One thing to note is after people like this kind of called out, another group formed uh, a YIMBY, yes, in my backyard, and actually with the Legal Aid Society pushed back and they didn't prevent and stop the closure of the hotel on the Upper West Side when they started to cause this cascade of moving individuals from various shelters and SROs and supporting housing to other areas, including young children who were getting displaced from the areas where they were going to school um, kind of halted that process a little bit, but it's still kind of dueling lawsuits going on. So why, why does this matter so much to, you know, individuals experiencing homelessness and COVID-19? Well, Chrissy spoke a few weeks ago about how terrible it's been from a racial disparity standpoint into our community. And you can see here, there are 770 cases documented that doesn't count all the tons of other people that maybe showed up in the hospital that weren't tested that really did contract COVID-19. Um, but they were mostly in clusters, which makes sense. They were mostly in shelters. Of that, 58 people died who were experiencing homelessness. 54 of them were sheltered. So the average monthly in 2019 was 34 deaths. So it's 157% higher. And the general New York City sheltered population rate of deaths was 187 uh, per 100,000 compared to um, 291 per 100,000, which is a 56% increase from this year compared to last. And the graph on the right, the green is the, the uh, raw data for mortality for sheltered population. The top one is when you do age adjusting. And so that compared to the New York City general population, which is the middle one, it's, it's not quite double, but 
it's like 50% higher. So this is a huge problem for a population that we care for. Another issue uh, for people like Chrissy and some of the first years who visited Vocal with me this year during orientation, uh, we were told that one of the biggest issues that people complain about in their just general life is being able to access bathrooms, stay clean, and they actually have a bathroom at Vocal that people can access at any time to change, shower, get cleaned up, and feel, feel maybe a little bit more human. COVID's made it really difficult for people to access businesses, places like Starbucks or the library, which have all been closed to the general population, just to use a bathroom. And so this is one person's story of saying how they had ulcerative colitis and IBS and were in tons of pain, wanted to use a bathroom, went to some hospital, I don't believe this is ours, and they didn't allow them in to just use a simple restroom. Um, and I think this is something we should think about when we have patients who come in who maybe smell bad or have feces on them, that this isn't how they want to be. This is you know, something that they're dealing with. And I can think of at least two incident instances where somebody really, by getting them a shower, getting them the bathroom, changing them, cleaning them up, really changed the outcome. And when I was an intern, uh, Betty, for those who remember her, uh, with the help of Miss Chin, who's like one of our most amazing nurses, got this gentleman cleaned up. And because of that, was able to, initially the thinking was that he had uh, frostbite or some other condition, but really just had really horrible DVTs. But none of that probably would have been worked up if he hadn't been clean and made to be feeling more human. So language and stigma, um, I think these are important things to just talk a little bit about and what you say to your patients reflects on them, how, you, how they perceive you think about them and feel about them. So just very basic stuff. Um, these are six types of housing for people who are housing insecure. Um, the one on the top left is actually the 30th Street Men's Shelter. This is the former Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital, uh, now the main intake center for single adult men and adult families. It's actually where myself and a few uh, other med students started a naloxone training program in med school. Uh, in the top middle is a low or barrier free shelter where you're kind of given a bed and they really don't impose much on you. It's one of the challenges to having people in shelters. They don't like it because people impose rules. Like I'm sure most of us don't want to live with our parents anymore and don't want to be told when you can come or go or what you can have. Uh, the top right is transitional housing and probably most of the people who are later displaced when we think about the traditional hotels where undomiciled individuals stay or sheltered domicile, they have a lot of support structures to try and get them out of this cycle. The bottom left is an example of a sanctioned encampment. There's also unsanctioned encampment. This is one that uh, San Francisco created during COVID-19. The middle and the bottom is an SRO, and this is what a lot of hotels have. And a lot of programs are also kind of pushing more towards supportive housing. And this is maybe the end of, you know, after you're going through a shelter system or transitional housing, people who are identified as requiring continued help and support get a model like this. And there have been some studies of varying success that have shown uh, decreased ED visits. That's something we should all care about. Monty actually has a program and they've kind of tried this out. I don't think they've saved as much money as we would like, but it certainly treats people a little bit more humanely. So if everybody could maybe take a moment and just close your eyes and picture what the word homeless evokes or homelessness evokes and then kind of to try and define it for yourself. You don't need to tell me. So per Webster's, another Noah, um, having no home or permanent place of residence. Well, I, I think this is a, the first part it's a bad definition because it includes the word home. Permanent place of residence, well, is that having an address that you can use? Is that something that you can put on a voter registration form? This is how a lot of these people get disenfranchised. I think it's a little bit more complicated. And when you talk to people, a lot of them think they have homes. They feel that where they stay on the street or where they live in a shelter is having a home. And so a lot of people don't like the idea 
of calling people who are sheltered domiciled or living on the street homeless. Um, it's something that they themselves can still create a community with or without what we think of as like physical constructs um, and what we value in society. So just because you don't have a physical house, apartment, um, something that you own or rent doesn't mean that you don't have a home. So some more preferred terms would be somebody who's housing insecure, and this could even apply to somebody who's at risk of eviction, something that should be on our minds right now because there are eviction moratoriums, which are probably preventing a large number of people from experiencing some form of homelessness or um, being sheltered, receiving some type of support. And so as those programs start to collapse and fall apart, we should start asking these during you know, our patient encounters. Um, an undomiciled person, an unhoused person, a sheltered domicile person for somebody who's living in a shelter. I think this is important for when we're like documenting where somebody's going and understanding the disposition for a patient is are they going back to the street? Are they going to a shelter? Are they going to some other environment? Um, and then people experiencing homelessness, it takes, it's instead of calling somebody homeless. And I think this is not so different than people saying, try not to use the term sickler for somebody who has sickle cell disease. You don't wanna label the person with their disease. And it was actually Dr. Stetz that really, um, I think did a great job for me in kind of driving that home. Um, don't define the person by their disease and homelessness is no different. And stigma, I think the same way, don't label somebody this. If you call them homeless, if you are referring to them as homeless, if you're not kind of appreciating what they value, you're making so much more and they're gonna perceive this on them and how you think about them. So try to change your language, treat people kindly. Um, and this is somebody who previously experienced homeless talking about this. We need to look at the various stigmas or labels we put on people who are homeless and stand up and be accountable for the way we treat them. We need to learn to give trust. Don't be blinded by the stigmas that are put upon them. Extend an open hand and mind. Listen to them for they have a lot to say. We can understand if we try to comprehend what has befallen them, then and only then will we begin to understand the plight of people who are homeless. All right, so a little bit of data. So here are some trends of homelessness. So before the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a homelessness epidemic. This is just on the single nights how many people were in the shelter system. This isn't how many people have gone through the shelter system. That's over 100,000 people um, in a given year who will go through the New York City shelter system. Uh, the numbers have actually gone down a little bit right before the pandemic or during the pandemic for the reasons I mentioned before of the eviction moratoriums. Um, but this is something that has been a huge problem that probably in many ways have been ignored. And some simple proportions of in June, um, how people who, what kind of made up the people who were in the shelter system. So it's pretty even between a third of them, 20,000, about 20,000 children were staying in the New York City shelter system in a night um, compared to 20,000 single adults, almost entirely men, uh, and then adults and families uh, making up the other third. So this is a huge problem, you know, just for children, for everybody, which I think, you know, is a little bit of a tearjerker. Hopefully that can motivate us a little bit more. And then race uh, is a huge factor as well. Um, Pacific Islanders, very small population in New York City, but have a very high rate amongst themselves of um, experiencing homelessness. And you can just see how whites and Asian Americans um, have very low rates compared to uh, Black, Latinx, um, and Native American individuals. But I think it's also worth noting uh, jail. Uh, so this is a pro, uh, this is a study by Ross McDonald at now now he's at NYU Bellevue, but 
he was, I think, previously the director of the of Rikers Island's uh, health program. And you can kind of see how quality of life policing, broken, win broken windows has influenced who ends up getting uh, arrested and put in jail. Not charged, maybe charged with a crime, but not convicted of a crime, because this is just looking at Rikers. And this study looked at people who were hotspotters, who were in Rikers over the, the study period from 2008 to 2014, about 14 or more times. And actually it went above there and those are the, the darker bars compared to the control group, which was less than that by a substantial margin. Um, and so you can just compare like what they were charged with. And when you think about people who are experiencing homelessness, the criminal trespass in the second degree, that's somebody calling the police calling 911 when somebody's sleeping in their vestibule or sleeping in front of their home or sleeping in front of, you know, whatever on the street that they don't want to see them there, uh, maybe in front of a store. Uh, criminal possession of a substance to the seventh degree, that might be, again, somebody's sleeping on the street, somebody doesn't like them there, calls the cops and they find something on their person. Um, it might even just be drinking an open container on, on the street. Theft of services by a little bit higher and then petty larceny. So maybe just stealing from like a store because they're trying to feed themselves. And if you compare just like the misdemeanors compared to felonies, it's almost 90% of the things that bring people into Rikers who have very frequent visits is just petty larceny compared to the control group, which is closer to 50-50. And just zooming in a little bit to who's experiencing um, homelessness in this population, at least 409 of the 790 individuals, uh, or sorry, uh, 800 individuals, were had some documented homelessness in their chart. However, there's a large number that's missing. And that's because when you give somebody an address, people don't want to admit that they don't have a home. And so this is actually, it's probably even higher proportion they're actually homeless. Uh, and then I think it's important also to mention how mental illness and the dismantling of our um, kind of institutions for mental health has kind of created a huge problem. And then alcohol or drug use is a huge problem for these individuals as well, and is also a huge problem for individuals experiencing homelessness. And so it's something that, since it's criminalized, it brings people in and out of the criminal justice system frequently. Uh, Geraldo Rivera, before he was really crazy, uh, was kind of involved in dismantling the Willowbrook State School. And it's definitely worth reading about the history of the hepatitis A vaccine and what happened there and how they developed it. Um, but he was part of, you know, bringing out these exposés of the horrors of mental health institutions. And by creating deinstitutionalization, it put tons of people on the streets who couldn't really care for themselves because we didn't create adequate services to actually help and care for them. Um, and this is something that we continue to see this day. And I'm sure everybody here with somebody you've worked with who's living on the street or in the shelter have noticed huge rates of some form of mental health. Um, and so if we're not gonna have institutions to house people, we need to put more and invest more into our community um, health programs to provide mental health services and housing for these individuals. Otherwise, they're gonna be in and out of city jails, in and out of the emergency department. And I think, again, none of us wanna see either of those also a huge issue for LGBTQ youth. They represent about 40% of the homeless youth population. And this is because it's still a huge social issue in many homes. And so people are kicked out of their homes. Um, luckily, there are some programs and organizations that really focus on this issue, but it's still something that we need to think about, especially when you're in PEDS or maybe even somebody an adult who's like 20 or 19 having these discussions. So what are we doing? Um, not just at Kings County, but kind of what's, what's going on? Well, here's a sandwich. Um, yesterday, there were actually no sandwiches in the entire ED. And I went to the kitchen and got us a bag of sandwiches. Um, but sometimes that's all that somebody wants. 
but maybe we could do a little better social work consult. Um, what do they generally do? They give a list of the locations where somebody can go and enter the shelter system. I will tell you those locations and you don't even need to ask social work for that anymore. Uh, the launching position, I am guilty of doing this myself. Um, you're allowed to sleep the night, but I'm definitely not signing you out in the morning. The waiting room, and I think this is something very good that we do do during the winter or during the summer. So when it's very hot or very cold, we try and make the waiting room into somewhat of a welcoming place um, by saying anybody can be there. But if you look at the actual benches, they're not places where you can comfortably sleep. And so it's no surprise that a lot of our patients would rather be in a stretcher in the ED than be in the waiting room where they don't have a sheet, they can't cover their face. I like to sometimes give people maps when they don't know how to get to the, the 30th Street Men's Shelter or wherever they want to go, their, their current shelter, and print it out. And I think mentioning the MTA is important, but they didn't want anybody to sleep on in the subway system anymore, so they removed the backs of benches. Um, those new trains, also the way that they have a, if you've sat on them like with the blue benches, they have like a weird slope in the back and it's supposed to be extremely uncomfortable to sleep on. And I think it's the old R42s maybe um, with the bucket seats. Those are also meant to be uncomfortable to sleep on by putting dividers in between them. So it's not just that they're, they're too skinny for most New Yorkers. Um, they're also meant to prevent people from sleeping on them. And during COVID, we've also seen this where they've been shutting the, the subway system down in the middle of the night. And so how many times have you worked in the ED and around 2, 3 a.m., a whole bunch of people get brought in to the ED now with some type of like weird complaint or really it's just the cops threw me off the train. I said, you know, I have nowhere else to sleep. It's getting cold now, especially. And so they say they have some problem. They come to the ED. Um, and this is something that the city and the MTA hasn't really adequately addressed, I think. And going back to what brings people into Rikers for the hotspotters, you know, is community policing, quality of life policing, comp stat, broken windows. You know, people don't, you know, want to see people on the street sleeping there. They don't want to see things that ruin the beauty of their environment. And the idea of comp stat and broken windows is just one broken window is going to increase the crime in an area. And so these type of programs that were created during mostly Giuliani's time as mayor um, are things that continue today and continue to affect a large number of our patients, our community, um, not just the entire city. So what are some things to do? Uh, I think the easiest thing is show everybody compassion, treat everybody as a human being. That's really all they want. Um, it's not that difficult, but you do have to start checking your own bias and thinking about people. And sometimes it is helping to get somebody cleaned up, talk to the nurses and the techs. A lot of them will allow you to get them showered and will even help. And if you didn't know, we have showers right by the entrance to CCT at the ambulance bay. Um, and I think both ISO rooms at UHB actually have showers as well as something to note. So setting expectations. It's something I do, but I didn't realize how important it was until we visited Vocal. And this was more in a, com a conversation with people experiencing substance use disorders, but telling people how long it takes, uh, telling them what you're able to provide, being honest with them is actually really helpful. Uh, these are people who have spent many, time, many hours in the ED feeling like they weren't being treated like humans or like patients like everybody else. And just telling them, you know, this is how long this does take. This is what we're going to do for you is apparently, according to uh, the people who spoke to us at Vocal, something that could be very helpful. Sometimes people might even have like a navigator uh, that they can they, they can put you in contact with and you can talk to them who might have a little bit better understanding. So I already mentioned showers, bathroom, clothes. I, don't know if we still have the clothes in the old ops unit. The last time I tried to go there, the door was locked and maybe this is something we have to start addressing and figure out. 
a lot of other hospitals have like very cheap sweatpants and stuff lying around instead of kind of the weird mixture of uh, pants and everything that may or may not fit. And I think that's something as a department that would be pretty high yield for our patients. And I think it would definitely make it easier to get people undressed instead of sending people out into the cold in paper scrubs. Um, but offering shower and bathroom is sometimes all that people want. And some of those things maybe we could consider if we want to reduce the burden on the ED itself, maybe you don't need to get registered for those type of things because then we can all be honest with each other and not have somebody come in just for those things and we can provide them to them in a more easy, less costly way. So as I said, I would tell you where you can enter the shelter system. It's actually kind of annoying. Um, so if you're a family with children, you have to go all the way to the Bronx. Um, if you're an adult family, you can go to East 30th Street. That's a 30th Street men's shelter. Uh, a little easier for us. For single adult men, as I said before, you go there as well. That's the only place in the entire city that you can't send them to the shelter on Bedford, for example. They have to go to intake at 30th Street. If they go to Bedford, they sometimes might be able to bust them over, but for the most part, they should go to the 30th Street men's shelter. And for women, uh, there's in Brooklyn on Williams Avenue and the Franklin shelter in the Bronx. And that's kind of where you can refer people to. This is essentially what social work gives to patients who don't have a home or a house to live in. And some basic programs. This, I don't even think it's worth remembering, but just each individual one, just remember that if somebody you speak to is saying that they're having difficulty um, with paying their bills, that they are concerned about eviction, uh, you can just Google these, you'll find these. These are the programs in New York City that are available. And I've done this at least once or twice for a patient and did also get them social work, but I don't even think they referred them to these. Um, it's pretty easy. And again, we're gonna probably see an uptick in evictions in the coming months as those eviction moratoriums uh, go away. And there's specific help and shelter for victims of domestic violence. So when you have a patient and you screen them for domestic violence or they're coming in uh, from assault in, of some form, there's a specific number you can call or you can have them call to be referred to specific victim services. And some kind of local organizations, CAMBA, Vocal, which I mentioned, these are actually the people who organize the Occupy City Hall. Um, we visited them during orientation and they're extremely enthusiastic to work with us. Uh, the Coalition for the Homeless, they're the people who kind of compile all the numbers every kind of every year for who's in the shelter system and are a big advocacy group. And New Alternatives is specifically for LGBTQ youth. Um, so in summary, COVID has disproportionately impacted unhoused communities. Our history of being unhoused is long and endearing and rooted in racial and mental health issues. I was going to talk a little bit more about history, but we didn't have enough time. Prison and housing and security are very intertwined. Language matters. Don't stigmatize your patients and community and always be compassionate. Any questions? No. Dr. Wallace? Uh, I feel like social work has been better in recent months, years, especially with the care management, and case management kind of uh, uh, involvement. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I think care management has been really helpful for people in, in like my, my limited experience or people who have like some chronic health condition or new newly diagnosed diabetes is probably the most frequently thing frequent thing that I have referred to care management. And my understanding is they seem to be pretty good at following up. Uh, I spoken to care management in the past about these type of issues and they pretty much were like, no, we don't do that. We just handle uh, like managing new high blood pressure, starting somebody on insulin, like these very specific things or making sure that somebody's insurance is gonna cover the river roxaban versus the apixaban. So they're like super helpful. Social work, I think there's some social workers who are very motivated. I think obviously should never lump the entire, you know, everybody into the group in that way. But I definitely 
would say, and I don't know if people have other experiences that they still mostly give the photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy sheet of paper with resources. Actually, I think case management was more than in King's County and more recently. And I think sometimes it depends too on how you, uh, how you phrase it with the students. Like, because if you talk to them about that this is the high utilizer of the EV, that's what they're there to try to help them understand. Uh, and then, I mean, as you apply multiple times, these patients have significant medical problems. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's about talking to them about the, those factors rather than just phrasing it that, oh, this person needs somewhere to go. But it, so, sometimes if they have significant medical issues or disabilities, it's an easier way to navigate that. The big problem is most because of their undocumented and, and things like that, but it's, it's really difficult to do. Yeah, and, and there are also medical shelters and so sometimes you can document if what you put in the discharge paperwork what you document as a note saying what somebody needs can also be helpful because as you know people do have these chronic health issues they have difficulty with stairs they get placed in a shelter that doesn't have an elevator um and i think social work can sometimes help navigate those issues because they probably have a better understanding of those systems than we do my question is that those shelters are a little more stable. I don't know about that, but it's a little more stable in terms of just, I'm not sure. Yeah, so if you're, the way it gets complicated though, because you get assigned a shelter, and so you go to intake at those locations, whether the Bronx, 30th Street, William Street here, um, and they evaluate you, somebody kind of documents like what your requirements are. Do you have a wheelchair? Do you have, you know, do you need to have insulin syringes available? And then you spend some time in intake figuring out where they're going to place you, and then they finally place you. Um, but if you don't like your placement, it becomes like, so they can be more permanent, but it's really, again, you wouldn't want to live with your parents again under all these rules, and it can be really difficult, and especially when you add in all the mental health issues and other medical comorbidities and substance use. Um, so it's complicated, the whole shelter system. Stephanie? Oh, I was just going to say, we actually recently used um, to pull it Right. I don't know. I remember sort of when I was starting out, you feel like you wanted to just pull these patients to get the end of like discharge, discharge, but now I think it might be more appropriate to just like some community Yeah, no, I had a, a similar thing at UHB where I kind of forgot about that. It was 6 a.m. or actually it was like 6.30 and the guy still wanted some more time in a warm place. Then I was like, oh, you can go to the, the waiting room. And then it's like, oh, no, you can't go to the waiting room. Um, I think that's where setting the expectations and not really negotiating, but setting the expectation that you, you know, you do have to leave by this time. I think maybe with COVID, we're going to have to be a little more open to what that time is as it gets colder and maybe less appropriate to just go onto the street and figure out some solutions to that. Anybody else? Okay, thank you.